Well, hey, welcome to the message. Here at Colonial Church, we're all about loving God, loving people, and loving life. We pray that this message would be practical and inspiring for you in your everyday life. God bless you. Uh, We've been in an awesome series at church. Has anybody else been loving the Margin series? I like, (laughs) and I was like, yeah, average, an average amount. We love it. (laughs) It has been unbelievable. And honestly, for me personally, even though rest and uh, just taking a breath is really, really important for Matt and I, we try to live our lives in a way that we have margin and have Sabbath and regularly regularly, um, take time to just assess where our health is. Um, I feel like my whole life shifted in that series. Like I can't go back to the way things were. You know, when you start hearing things and you're like, hey, wait a minute, having margin actually affects everything about my life. So if you didn't get a chance to listen to that, you can watch that on our YouTube channel, Colonial Church STA, or you can listen to it on the podcast. And there's actually also um, something we're doing now, a podcast called Deep Dive, where after each message, um, whoever brought the word will sit down and they'll go through just a little bit deeper behind the message and kind of the things that you don't get to get out in in this moment, in this context. And so that's really, really helpful if you want to just go a little deeper and grow a little bit more. Awesome. Another amazing thing that happened this past month, at the beginning of the month, was we had our first Woven Sisterhood Night, which was so fun. If you don't know what Woven Sisterhood Night is, it's a citywide gathering that we're now doing monthly Um, And it's just the women of our city coming together, worshiping, we're in the word, and we're having community. We're just growing together as women of God. So invite your girlfriends. I had the opportunity to preach a message called, All I Want for Christmas is You. And if you were there, you would know that we blasted Mariah Carey's version on YouTube on the screen. And then... After we lip synced with air microphones to the song, I know this sounds ridiculous if you like this isn't your thing, but it was awesome. Then we all stood up and we danced for a minute and it was like Mariah was frolicking with Santa and it was just amazing. Um, You know, it was awesome. So I don't know what you think about that, but let me just tell you it was awesome and God loves it when his daughters and his sons have fun in his house. And so we had a lot of fun and I actually left that night and I I felt like I walked out of um, church and I got in my car and it was like God said, I'm not finished with that message yet. And and he just downloaded like these points. Like it doesn't happen like that for me often, but it was like God gave me three points for things that he wanted me to keep bringing from the word that he revealed to me in Luke 1. And so this morning, is kind of like All I Want for Christmas is You, part 1.5 with a different title. So you'll hear more about that in a minute. Um, But there's so much happening just in the life of church that I'm really excited about. All the things that Maddie shared. And we're also doing a candlelight service on December 24th, which is going to be beautiful. One hour, um, I I think it starts at 4 o'clock. So don't miss that. That's going to be so special. And then, of course, the 22nd is Christmas at Colonial. (laughs) I love this season. Um, but I don't know about you, but my, as this stuff has been happening and as, uh, you know, the Christmas season rolls around, my inbox starts to get a little bit full. Is anybody else's <laughs> emails, uh, text messages, Black Friday, like, I just want to quit email now because Black Friday, I don't even know I subscribe to so many emails. Like, when did I sign up? You know, when you're like, oh, I could use that 10% discount code, maybe one day, I'm not going to buy anything today. And all of a sudden, you're subscribed to like 4,000 million emails, and then they all come on Black Friday reminding you of the great deal you could get, and you seem to realize around that time that you subscribe to everything, and so therefore you subscribe to nothing, because you can't read all the emails and get all the things and all the goodies that you could possibly want because you can't get through them all. And so that kind of happened to me this year. I'm probably the only one, but it's cool. I'm just going to quit my email, and if it's important, people can text me. So if I don't email you back, you know why now. My inbox on my texts, it's like the blue lights are lighting up. A lot of blue lights in my life. So there's a lot happening in in my inbox, and I felt like... um, God just started revealing something to me. But sometimes we can start to miss the message because there's so many messages. We're kind of like involved in so many things that we can't get the things that matter. And I actually had a friend that I really wanted to meet um, for coffee. And she had messaged me on Instagram. 
And I was like, oh, here's my number. Just text me because I'll get it there. Um, And so she messaged me. And sometimes my kids will get my phone and they'll like, it'll pop up the text and they'll hit the open button and they know all my passwords. So they're like, ding, 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 here they are. Also, hey world, do you want to know all my mom's passwords? I'll yell it. And so they they open up my phone and then sometimes my text messages will go from blue to not blue. And this particular number I didn't have saved in my phone. So it went into the like oblivion of texts that had, had been read. So sure enough, my friend, who's so sweet and in the kindest way, messaged and just said, hey, did you get my message? And I was like, oh, I was looking for the message. I didn't get the message. I didn't say that. And I just had that thought, like, somebody probably opened that message. So I go scrolling through my text messages. And sure enough, there's a text message from her. And so I messaged her straight back. Hey, oh my gosh, yes, I wanted me. I'm so sorry I missed this. Um, And in that moment, it was like the light bulb went off. Sometimes we're sitting around in life and we've got so much going on and life gets so busy that all of a sudden we just hear this voice, you know, something stirs in our hearts and it's like God reaches down from heaven and he just kind of whispers at us, hey, did you get my message? Because we're so busy that it's easy um, for his message to get lost in all of the other things going on in our world. It's not hard to get so busy that we forget to like star as important, flag as like go back to this one, don't miss this one, you know, and all of a sudden we're subscribed and we're listening and surrounded by so many things we forget what's really important, the most important thing, which is to hear from him because it affects everything about our life, right? So if you're looking for a title this morning, The title of my message is, Did You Get My Message? Everybody say that with me. Did you get my message? (laughs) That was so quiet. Let's try it again. Did you get my message? (laughs) All right, let's pray. God, we love you so much. And we don't want to miss the message this morning. We don't want to miss what you have for us. We know that you love to speak. God, we know that you love us, that you see us where we are. Um, There's not a moment that's missed by you, God, that you see our season, you see what life looks like, whether it's a mountaintop or a valley. You see it, God, and you're with us through it all. So Holy Spirit, would you just soften our hearts, open up our ears, God, and open up our eyes to see and hear you. We're so grateful for your love, God, and it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Awesome. So I believe that this morning that there is a message from heaven for you and for me. And I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way, but God loves to speak to us. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation. He wants you to hear him. He's not trying to hide from you. He's not trying to, like, see if you can figure it out. The Bible actually says, Jesus said, my sheep know the sound of my voice. And if you think about, like, when you first meet somebody, if they call you, and you don't have their number saved, and you pick it up, you know, you can be like, hey, who is this? And they're like, oh, this is so-and-so. And And after they call you more, and you guys get to know each other better, they might call you again and say, hey, it's me, and say whatever their name is. And you're like, no, I know it's you. Why? Because you recognize their voice. And it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. The more you get to know God, the more you get to know him as a close friend and as a heavenly father, And as the Spirit of God living inside you, the more you just begin to recognize his voice. And you shouldn't be worried if at the start you're kind of like, I don't really know how to figure this out. Like, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to hear from God. That'd be awesome. It'd be great if he could like maybe send me an email because that would be very simple and I could copy, like read it, print it out. But that's not how it works because, uh, you know, God doesn't use email. (laughs) or Maybe he does. I don't know. But I'm fairly certain that's not his uh, formal communication route. So you and I get the joy of figuring out this adventure of the God life just by like unwrapping little surprises that he puts along the way for us to find him. He's like the ultimate gift giver. He'll set something in front of you and you're like, oh, I think this is God. And then you kind of open it up and like look into a little bit more and you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It's like he's just giving you bits along the way to go, this is who I am and I love you. And so I thought this morning... 
just to kind of shape what we're about to do, I would tell us a story, one of my favorite stories and where I've been reading in the past um, month or so in the Bible. And, and this is cool to me because before there was Bibles, just free access for anybody that wanted one, people would tell stories and that's how they would pass down what God had done. They would tell the generations what God had done in the past. And so we're going to start telling a story. I'm going to start telling you a story from Luke 1. And so this is when um, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who are faithful God lovers, the Bible tells us that they loved God, they were faithful, they followed his commandments. Zechariah is a priest. Elizabeth comes from a family of priests from the house of Aaron. And it is Zechariah's priestly order's turn to serve in the temple. And so they, the way they decide who's going to go in is they cast lots and Zechariah is chosen. So off he goes into the temple. And this is like a big deal, right? Because you would do this like once. And if you get it wrong, you die. So like a, it's kind of, there's kind of a lot of pressure happening. And he goes in, clean hands, pure heart, goes before the Lord and Um, It says just before this that they had served the Lord all their life, but there was this one thing that they were lacking, and it was that Elizabeth had been barren, so she couldn't have children, and they were on in their years. In some translations, it says they were old, but I don't like that translation. We say they were seasoned, so they were seasoned believers, Um, but she couldn't have children, and so Zechariah goes in. And he begins to burn incense on the altar. People outside are worshiping. And all of a sudden, an angel appears, the angel Gabriel. And it says that the angel Gabriel was at the post next to the throne of God. And this I love, because if you can imagine, if there is going to be an angel posted next to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, This is not going to be like the pretty little angels that we draw or see on like a Christmas tree. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Like our version of like angels, oh, the halos and so cute. I mean like a majestic creature formed with the breath of God and given like beauty to reflect his own beauty. Because the angels, see, it can be the most beautiful, incredible thing in the world. All it's doing is reflecting the beauty and the glory of God. So here comes this creature, and it says that he was afraid, because imagine. It's not like the angel floats in with the, like, what's it called, the little garlands that we put on the cute little kids to do. This is like an angelic being. And he's afraid, and the angel comes in, and he says, don't be afraid. Then he, he begins to tell Zechariah that I'm going to, God has sent me to give you a message that what you've been longing for and what you've been hoping for, this child is going to be born to, to your wife, and you're to name him John. Not only is the promise going to come to pass, that thing you've been longing for, not only am I going to fulfill that and bless you with that, says God, but also John is going to prepare the way for the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And because of his testimony and his faith and the man that he will be, people are going to begin to turn their hearts back towards God. So not only are you going to have a promised child, but this kid is about to change the course of history. And how many of you know that when you wait and wait and wait and wait for a promise, God is not being unkind. He just has something better than you could possibly imagine. So this all kind of unfolds. And Zechariah's like, how could, I mean, but we're old, basically, is what he says. We can't have kids. Like, my wife is along in years. This isn't possible. And so, unfortunately for him, because of his doubt, he's not able to talk until his son is born. Actually, eight days after his son is born, that's later on in the story. So then you find the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary, a young girl, Most historians and theologians believe she was anywhere between 12 or 13, 16 or 17. It doesn't really matter. She's young. It's a young girl. She's engaged to be married to Joseph. And this angel appears. Same thing. She's afraid because it's this beautiful, angelic creature just appears. And it's God coming to earth. That's not normal. See, for us now, it's like we get a message from God by the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And we're like, oh, that's amazing. You know, like... Thank you, God. But this is not normal for them. 
to have this encounter with God where God is speaking to them. And so she's afraid and, and he says that God has taken great delight in you. And so he's chosen to give you this gift that you're going to carry the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're to call him Jesus. And his kingdom will have no end. And he basically is saying, everything from this point is about to change. This is the one you've been waiting for. And God chose you. And she has this moment of getting to respond. What am I going to do with this information? How's it going to happen? What am I supposed to tell my fiance? You know, all of these things as a young girl would be running through her mind. This isn't how I thought it would look. But then she chooses to say, yes to God, I'll be your servant. Whatever you say, whatever you require of me, I say, yes, God. So the power of the almighty God overshadows her and the virgin conceives a holy God, king of heaven, servant king, fully God, fully man, put on flesh, come to dwell with us because of this young girl's yes. And so the story just keeps unfolding, and it's just beautiful because Mary gets up and she runs straight to Elizabeth's house, who is her aunt. <laughs> and when she greets her, Elizabeth feels the baby in her womb just jump for joy, and she begins to prophesy over Mary that this is what God did say this about you, and he confirms what happened. And then Mary turns around, and she begins to sing a prophetic song, and she's like, yes, this is what God said, and God is so good. And then she leaves and goes back, and it says later on in the story that as Elizabeth gives birth to John, Zechariah gets his voice back eight days after he's born and begins to prophesy over John, saying everything that the angel had prophesied over him and the message that he had delivered, yes, the son, my son, you are going to go before the Messiah, and then he's going to come and he's going to be a light in the darkness for all men. And so if you go from the beginning of this story just to where we finish there, you see three people in really, really different seasons of life. You have the beginning of a life and on in the years of a life, of two lives. You see promises hoped for, fulfilled, and you see dreams and visions that a young girl has shift, but actually come to pass greater and more beautifully than you could ever imagine. So I don't know where you are this morning in the room, but it doesn't matter what season you are in life, God has something for you today, and he is inviting you into a story that will change somebody's course of history, their life forever, if you're just willing to say yes. But there's a few things we have to start to understand if we want to live lives that are going to radically change the world, we want to live a yes, God kind of a life, which is honestly where my heart usually falls. It's the simplest way that I know how to think about it as a believer, is if I can just choose to keep saying yes, God, every time he puts something in front of me, everything's going to be okay. It might look impossible, but if God says this is next and I say yes, God, then I'm like, it's on you. I can trust you. I know you, I can trust you, and I'm, I'm like, show me where this goes, God. So does anybody want to hear from God today? <laughs> me. <laughs> so the title is, Did You Get My Message? Here is a few helpful ways, I hope, that it's how to get a message, but also to respond to it. Number one, listen to the word. It might not come in a way that you're expecting. It might actually make you kind of like, oh, startled, like I wasn't ready for this kind of an encounter. It might take you by surprise. But if you're able to hear it and listen to it, then you're going to be able to do something with it and choose to say, yes. I think about Zechariah in this passage. It wasn't common for you to go and offer up a sacrifice and for God to speak to you, you were the one lifting up the prayers of the saints. You were the one going to exalt God. You were the one doing something, and yet God came to meet him where he was and had a word for him, and it was different than he was expecting. It says, Luke 1.13, but the angel reassured him, saying, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God is showing grace to you, for I have come to tell you that your prayer for a child has been answered not will be answered, has been answered. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to name him John. 
Listen to the word. He gave him a specific. If you're not listening, you might miss the specifics. You are to name him John. His birth will bring you much joy and gladness. This is more specifics, right? You need to know that, John, that Zechariah, his birth, John's birth, it's going to bring you joy. It's going to bring you gladness. This is something to look forward to. And it says, many will rejoice because of him. He will be one of the great ones in the sight of God. He will drink no wine or strong drink, but he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even while still in his mother's room, womb. And this is not common. People weren't just walk, like, like today, the Holy Spirit is in us and was given to us as a gift. That's, this is not the same. This is before that happens. So the fact that it was prophesied that John would be full of the Holy Spirit, even in his mother's womb, is like, what? And it says, and he will persuade many in Israel to convert and turn back to the Lord their God. He will go before the Lord as a forerunner with the same power and anointing as Elijah the prophet. He will be instrumental in turning the hearts of the fathers in tenderness back to their children and the hearts of the disobedient back to the wisdom of their righteous fathers. And he will prepare a united people who are ready for the Lord's appearing. That was his word. And Mary, this is new for them. <laughs> this is a new thing that's happening. And it says in Luke 1.31, this is what the angel said to Mary. You will become pregnant with a baby boy, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be supreme and will be known as the son of the highest, and the Lord God will enthrone him as king on his ancestor David's throne. He will reign as king of Israel forever, and his reign will have no limit. And then in Luke one thirty one, it says, what's more, your aged aunt, another promise, Elizabeth has also become pregnant with a son. The barren one is now in her sixth month. Not one promise from God is empty of power, for nothing is impossible with God. <laughs> Come on. New scenario. What the heck is happening? I'm sitting here, and angels appeared. This promise, this, this message from heaven feels impossible, and yet she's also met with something impossible that's already happened right? Because sometimes God will, sh will speak to us, will show us something that he's inviting us to that looks impossible, and then we'll say, but listen to this. When I did this in the past, let this be a reminder you, to you today that not one promise from God is empty of power, for nothing is impossible with God. And maybe that's you this morning. You're like, this is kind of new. Like, this is kind of new for me. I don't know what to do with the idea that God wants to speak to me and wants a dialogue with me. But can I encourage you that it's okay to not feel like you're a professional at this? It's okay to walk out the journey of figuring it out. It's okay to start with step one. You don't have to pretend like you're at step 10 because God doesn't need you to be perfect. He just needs you to be available to listen. And here's some practical tips because I really, really loved in the margin series when Maddie gave practical tips, so I'm just stealing it. I'm going to give you some practical tips for listening to the word. Number one, get interrupted. We need to be willing in our everyday life to get interrupted by the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. Don't become so busy and so focused and you know, so in tune with what's happening in your everyday natural world that you miss the supernatural encounter that God wants to have with you. Get interrupted. Number two, don't interrupt. <laughs> don't try to finish the sentence for God. If he starts speaking to you, sometimes our prayers are a lot of talking and not a lot of listening. And there's this beautiful moment when you're in a dialogue with God, with a heavenly father who loves you, or if you're just quiet for long enough, you start to hear him speak. So don't interrupt. When he starts speaking to you, even if it feels unfamiliar and you kind of want to fill the silence, just wait. Because it's beautiful what happens. I don't know how to describe it, except if you just wait for long enough, you'll know. 
You'll know it's him. You'll start to recognize his voice. And number three, be in awe that it's even happening. (laughs) Don't forget it's the God of the universe who chooses to speak to us, who wants to connect with us. Number four, listen with faith bigger than your fear. That's key. You got to listen with the kind of faith that says nothing is impossible with God. Number five, my favorite, check yourself before you wreck yourself. (laughs) confirm what he says with scripture because if he says it if the holy spirit says something to you it will always line up with his word always and if you're unsure find somebody who's seasoned to the word and go and go and meet with them find them and say hey this is what i feel like god's saying to me i just this is new for me can you help me with this and that's kind of like your backstop because god will always confirm it with his word if it doesn't line up with his word then it wasn't from god I don't really know what to say after that. It just doesn't. All right, number two, (laughs) listen to the word. Number two, believe the promise. And we always have this option. We get to believe what we hear or not, right? It's really hard, actually, to believe something that's impossible. If somebody says something to you and you're like, your rational brain is like, actually, that can't happen, then it's hard to believe when somebody tells you something that's impossible unless you believe in a God who does the impossible. You with me? It's hard to believe something that's possible. It's hard to believe something that's impossible can happen unless you believe in a God, in our God who does the impossible. That changes everything. And when you know who he is and what he's done, you start to realize that there is no limits. If God says it, it can happen. And this is what it says in Luke 1, 13. It says, but the angel reassured him to Zechariah. He says, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God is showing grace to you, for I have come to tell you that your prayer for a child has been answered. It's been answered. And then to Mary in Luke 1, 30, the angel reassured her, her, reassured her, reminded her, saying, do not yield to your fear, Mary. I love that. Do not yield to your fear, Mary, for the Lord has found delight in you, and he has chosen to surprise you with a wonderful gift. He's chosen you. Do you know he wants to give you a word? Because he's chosen you. You are a chosen person. God has chosen you, and he takes delight in you. And this is what it says in James 1.25. It says, Whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of his eye, (laughs) and sticks with it is no distracted scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. That person will find delight and affirmation in the action. You know, you can believe God. Even if you just catch a glimpse of something that he's saying to you, and you start to become a person of action, watch him affirm what he said to you as you start to walk it out. You can believe him and you can trust him. And here's something else that I picked up. And, and honestly, I can tell you the story of Luke 1, but go read it. Because the word is living and active. So as you read it, it's going to come alive for you in different ways. Just like every time I read back through, I'm like, oh, I never saw it that way. (laughs) I noticed that both Zechariah and Mary had questions. So the promise was revealed. The message was delivered. And they both had questions, but they both got really different answers. So when it comes to believing the promise... Zachariah receives his promise, your prayer for a child has been answered. And then he says, well, how can this be? Because my wife and I are along in years. And the result of that is that he has no voice for months and months and months. And as as, uh, a person who's lost their voice recently, I can tell you that it's really hard to do life, especially with small children, when you can't get their attention because nothing comes out. I'm like, what am I supposed, I can't go anywhere. I have three, I'm outnumbered. I can't even like grab them all with my hands. And they're not gonna listen to me or else even if they can hear my whisper, they're gonna like pretend like they didn't hear me because you know, (laughs) it's awesome. 
So they both have questions. Zechariah gets no voice until his son, eight days after his son is born, and Mary just gets a kind answer. And I was like, hang on a minute. That feels a bit unfair. And so I started thinking it through, you know, and, and I wondered for a moment, is this like when you have a daughter and you're like maybe a little more gentle on her and the son, you're like, go to your room. <laughs> and I don't think that's it. I think that Zechariah, who's a priest, who knows God, who's walked with God, who's seen his faithfulness, who is along in his years and who is seasoned, should have known that if God delivered a message that he would be faithful to complete it because he had seen God move. He had worshiped in his temple. He knew who he was. He should have known. And why God is kind and merciful, I just like that he kind of shut him up for a little while <laughs> just to help him remember God will do what he says he will do and you'll speak when your son is born and that will remind you that I did a miracle And for Mary, who's just at the beginning of her life, it just gets explained to her. How could this happen? How could this be? It's just an explanation that comes. That the power of the Almighty will overshadow you. And you know, when we're at the beginning of the journey of hearing from God, of listening to the word and believing what God said, God is kind so you don't have to be further on the journey. And, and actually, your response to what he says to you should just reflect the life that you've lived with him. That's the expectation. The level of our faith should reflect the level of our experience and our, and our knowing of God and his faithfulness and his goodness through our lives. That's what we're accountable for. So it's okay for you to just be where you are because isn't that what this whole season about? That is, isn't that what it's about? That Jesus came and he met us where we were, right? You don't have to be farther along than you are. Let's just respond to God the way that we know him. And let's rise up in faith. Let's ask God to give us the kind of faith that when we hear it, we're like, yes, God, because you've done it before and I know that you can do it again. You know what faith is? It's Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So I'm going to give you some practical, practical tips for believing the promise. Number one, remember where you came from. Remember God's faithfulness in the past. Remember what he's done for you. Don't forget to go back and go, yes, God, you've been so faithful in my life. Number two, don't look backwards while you're trying to run forwards. In other words, don't try to live off of the experience of the past without expecting to have a fresh encounter for today. There's a difference between remembering the faithfulness of God and trying to live off that faithfulness and not have a fresh encounter for today. Number three, use the tools that you find in your hands. They're there for a reason. So the things that you've learned and the ways that you've uh, over seasons learned to walk out life well, use those tools that God has taught you things. Use those tools to keep moving forward and look for the new things that he's putting in your hands. And, and I want you to write this down, number four. This is really important. Write this down. God chose me. I am the right person for the job. If you want to believe the promise, you have to believe that. God chose you. If he's given you a word, if he's put a dream inside of your heart, if you used to be barren and he's trying to give you a promise of fruitfulness, you need to write that down. God chose me. I'm the right person for this job. This might seem out of my comfort zone or beyond my capability, but God chose me and he put this word in my heart and therefore I am the right person for the job. He will equip me for what he's called me to. And the team's gonna come up and the last point I wanna share with us this morning is listen to the word, believe the promise and prophesy to the future. Speak over it. What does that mean? It's like a, church, a real churchy point three, right? Prophesy to the future. Speak over your future what God has promised you. 
Begin to speak it out. That's prophesying. It's calling something out that might not be there in the natural yet. But you're like, this is coming. You know why it's coming? Because God said it's coming. Yeah. That's prophesying to your future. You've got to take the promise that God gave us and begin to speak over our future. If you imagine what you thought your future was going to be like and God's just added this other layer, you are literally speaking over your future. No longer this, now this. Why? Because God said this, so that means it trumps whatever was before that. What does it mean to prophesy? It means to build up, stir up, cheer up. I love when Pastor Nathan Finocchio was here and he did a spiritual gifts class, and that was so simple and such an amazing way to grab onto the idea of prophecy. Build up, stir up, cheer up. Remind yourself that it is good what God said. Stir it up in you again. What happened in this passage is so incredible because it's like a prophecy party at the end of the passage. And I know that because you can read it. Elizabeth begins to prophesy over Mary when she steps through the door of her house. It said, with a loud voice, she prophesied with power, Mary, you are a woman given the highest favor and privilege above all others for your child is destined to bring God great delight. And it goes on, and then Mary begins to sing this prophetic song. And I like to imagine it like a Disney moment, you know, like birds chirping. And Mary's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like that was pretty good, right? That was real Disney. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Mary begins to sing, and she sings this, these praises to God. My soul is ecstatic overflowing with praises to God. My spirit bursts with joy over my life-giving God, for he set his tender gaze upon me, his lowly servant girl. And from here on, everyone will know I've been favored and blessed. Why? Because God spoke a promise over me. God has a promise for you. Therefore, you are favored and you are blessed. If you didn't know that this morning, it says the mighty one has worked a mighty miracle for me. Holy is his name. Mercy kisses all his godly lovers from one generation to the next. Mighty power flows from him to scatter all those who walk in pride. Powerful princes he tears from their thrones and he lifts up the lowly to take their place. And then down when Zechariah's son John is born, the promise comes to pass and, and they say, what will you name him? And Elizabeth says, his name will be John and they look to Zechariah and they're like, nobody in your family is named that. And all of a sudden, Zechariah's voice comes back and he says his name will be John. And in that moment, he turns and he begins to prophesy, it says in the word, over his son. So you've got Elizabeth who's prophesied over Mary. She's prophesied over her sister in Christ. And then you've got Mary who prophesies the word over herself again and then begins to prophesy over the generation to come. And then you've got Zechariah who's prophesying over the promise that's to come, the Messiah coming in his son, preparing the way. And he says, and I prophesy, my little son, you will be known as the prophet of the glorious God for you will be a forerunner going before the face of the master Yahweh to prepare hearts to embrace his ways. You will preach to his people the revelation of salvation life, the cancellation of all our sins. Bring us back to God. The splendor light of heaven's glorious sunrise is about to break in on us in holy visitation, all because the merciful heart of our God is so very tender. The word from heaven will come to us with dazzling light to shine upon those who live in darkness near death's dark shadow and he will illuminate the path that leads to the way of peace. So see, you and I, there's a message for us. And if we listen to the message, if we believe, if we're bold enough to believe the promise, we get to start prophesying over our future. We're a part of this. There was a before and there is an after. And prophesying over yourself and over the people around you and over what you're believing God said and for just means that you're going, no longer am I the before, now I'm the after. Even when I still feel like I'm the before, I'm the after because God said so. Elizabeth, from that moment, was no longer the barren woman. She was the woman who was fruitful. Her prayer was answered, not being answered. And so I want us to stand to our feet this morning because we're gonna begin to sing something out in just a moment. 
And this is what it says. It says, when I only see in part, I will prophesy the promise. I believe you, God. Because you finish what you start, I will prophesy the promise. I believe you, God. And we're gonna start just believing. And I, and I want you to take a minute. If there's not something that you know God has said yet, I want you to begin to ask him to open your ears and open your heart. And our ministry team is gonna come down to the front. They're gonna stand up here, you'll know who they are. They're gonna face you. So you'll be able to find them easily. And hey, if you've got a word and you're like, will you just seal this over me? Will you believe this with me? And you need to get it out and say it out loud. Just come down to the front and see them. If you feel like, I don't know how to hear from God. I'm not there yet, I'm at the start. Come down, let us pray for you to start hearing from God. But let's begin to prophesy what we see God saying over our future, not just staying where we are today, all right? So the team's gonna lead us when I only see in part. Well, hey, I hope you received something from that message. I wonder if you've ever received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'd love to include you in a prayer. The Bible tells us that all we have to do is believe in our hearts, confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God raised Him from the dead and we are saved. We actually don't have to do anything except receive this beautiful gift from God. So I wonder if you've ever made that choice to invite Jesus in. I would love to lead you in a prayer right now. Why don't you just repeat after me? Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me and you rose again. Forgive me of my sins, of all the things I've done wrong. I choose today to be a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. We really believe in that moment, if you pray that prayer from your heart, you move from not knowing God to knowing God. You're saved. And we would love to help you in any way we can in the journey. Please reach out to us at colonialchurch.life and we'll do everything we can to help you on this beautiful new journey of faith. God bless you.